Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight on this call and especially thanks to you, Neil, for doing this, um, especially after, you know, probably what's been a long weekend for you and, um, you know, you've just watched the, the event, you're probably wanting your tea as well. So uh, we're really grateful that you've come along to do it. Just for every, anybody that doesn't know much about Neil, I'm going to refer to my notes here because there's quite a lot to say as well, but Neil, Neil's got really good PBs of 119 for 600, one just over a shade over 146 for eight. You've got a PB this year indoors of 335, which is just a few hundredths off the Scottish record. And a PB in, indoors always bodes well because it's probably worth a couple of seconds over 1500, two to four seconds, hopefully. And um, yeah. it's a four minute mile as well. Um, and you've really kind of started to come through in 2018, didn't you? Um, and been in the British team, regular member of the British team since then, represent, representing Britain at the World Champs in Doha, here um, at the European Champs in Glasgow, where you unfortunately had norovirus as well. You couldn't take uh, place in the final, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I could give you the long or short version of that. <laughs> the short version is waking up on the day of the final, um, very ill, um, on, uh, where I really needed to be feeling quite good. And uh, yeah, just uh, couldn't get heat in me, had all sorts of layers on, and just sitting there shivering and not able to eat. You know, the usual horrible symptoms that are just, yeah, a bit of a death sentence on race day. I tried to warm yeah. up um, and I could barely hold my balance, never mind. No. Race of 1500 meters, so that was I. Uh, that was two years ago, so well, yeah. that was really un <laughs> unfortunate. The European champs indoors, never mind. We'll move it's on. It's not been my that. competition no so far, but yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> so I've kind of sort sorted the questions into starting out racing, training, America, and what's next for you. So, started out looking at your power of 10, you've been running for a long number of years, but did you start out in Giffen at North as an under 11? And how did you get into running, Neil? It was under 11, yeah. It was um, the famous Croy uh, wife, Hilary. Uh, she was a primary school teacher and gets the credit for suggesting that I should go along to Giffen North after a sort of fun run event that we had in primary school at Meadow Lee. Um, and I was kind of, I was excited at that because it sort of felt like I was being scouted, if that makes sense. It was kind of like, you know, friends of mine being scouted for a pro youth football team or something. So it sort of felt like that, like there was some attention, like, oh, okay, I better go along and see if I'm any good because I've been scouted for this. Um, of course, it was just, it was all very casual, but it was back in the clubhouse. Yes, no, Hillary. Uh, Mrs. Thompson said I should go along, and I think that was a good, uh, good bit of talent spotting from her. Um, and Claire uh, was my coach that very first night, and she had us doing all sorts of weird, weird drills. One including uh, not running with your arms and seeing how difficult it is when you don't run with your arms. Uh, as a valuable lesson that's still, uh, still relevant today. Um, so yeah, I just really enjoyed my first few sessions. Uh, uh, got racing soon after that, and I think did quite well in my first race at, uh, in Greenock, and sort of caught a bit of a bug. So I realised that you know I might have a bit of something. Uh, asked, were you always the fastest from a very young age? You've kind no, of answered that. Definitely not. <laughs> <But> no. <laughs> no. No. Is this, no. I mean, I um, I was always someone who was thereabouts in the sort of under 13 under 15 under 17 age groups I you know I was getting a bit better every year we have guys that were that were much better than me um get more developed or more you know uh more trained by that point uh well for whatever was certainly not uh, any of the top guys in Scotland. I was, you know, maybe fifth and tenth best, uh, usually, I'd say, around that sort of time in my teenage years, younger sort of teenage years. And slowly kept plugging away. And when I was under 15, I thought, oh, maybe, you know, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I'm not going to get any better. Maybe 
Um, this is just kind of where I'm at. I'm one of, you know, I, I, I sort of guy who can do quite well I'm at this national level, but maybe where I'll be. Um, and I was quite happy to just keep plugging away for the club, but uh, with, with some consistency and with some, you know, I got towards an under-17 um, under the guidance of Gordon Lockie, um, started to actually, you know, treat the sport as if um, I could I, I could get a lot better and I could actually, you know, do things um, at the Scottish level. And it was really just a case of Gordon believing in the great group that was at that time. Um, and there was competitiveness within the training environment and, and Gordon was great about uh, about getting us ready to you know to be uh, really competitive in the Scottish scene at that point um, and it, it just it sort of timed went quite well with where I probably physically developed a bit more as well maybe as probably a kind of a late developer as a teenager and that's something that just varies so much I mean some people might be sort of you know, well developed as a 15 year old, but it might, it might have taken me more like 18 to, you know, uh, fill out a little bit. I'm still, you know, waiting to fill out fully. I'm still <laughs> like, like the athlete, but, uh, yeah, just timed that quite well with, um, taking it more seriously and made lots of improvements when I was around 16 or 17, um, just taking it more seriously and, you know, getting those natural physical improvements, um, and started sort of winning, uh, the Scottish level which was just incredible at the time. Even looking back then, I never thought I would get to the level where I would win any sort of Scottish title. So that was pinnacle at that point. I didn't think I'd go in past that when I was a youngster. The club were absolutely what got me into the sport, kept me into the sport and, uh, and developed me to the point that, that I actually could see a future uh, in this sport beyond just, uh, you know, looking to... To, to do well for the club and uh, maybe uh, one day compete for Scotland. At that point, it wasn't so much about uh, competing well for myself as it was, you know, can we make the L final at Birmingham, that kind of thing. Um, and these kind of issues are actually garner your your real love for the sport and uh, the sort of team aspects never leave you that that is stuff uh, that I miss even now at the sort of um, more international level it's all quite individualistic but um, the, the team relays the team uh, competitions at the likes of Birmingham at these, these youth uh, finals were just uh, you know experiences that made me love this from the gun this place will go nuts if Lewis can hang on. Here comes Gorley at the wire, and it's Gorley of Virginia Tech. I mean, what was your decision? What was behind your decision to go to um, America? And, and Ruben would like to know what in particular drove the decision to go to Virginia Tech. So uh, around 17, I was starting to look at the American college system mainly because of Chris O'Hare, to be honest. I saw what he was doing in NCAA. He was a bit of a pioneer for a lot of the middle distance athletes that went over recently. Um, there's been such a start you know, in Scottish and indeed British athletes going over to the US. And I looked at the NCA as an opportunity where, you know, I wasn't good enough to be funded by UK athletics or anything like that. I didn't have the levels of support. Um, that, that the most talented youngsters um, my age would have. So I thought, well, what, I mean, what a great stepping stone it could be and a platform where I could all, you know, get my degree done and I could, um, you know, be in an environment where sport is so, like it is, it's just, um, you're really able to pursue both, um, without kind of sacrificing one or the other. I found a coach that, um, that I agreed with and got on well with and a program out there that uh, I could see myself doing well. And Virginia Tech, to answer Ruben's question, weren't exactly on my radar at first. The, the, the way I went about it um, was to contact about, I think I had a list of about universities that probably that could fit um, for, you know, being a good good fit for engineering and also, you know, a good, program with a good tradition uh on the track and sent out emails to these sort of 30 i mean some of them got back to me some of them didn't that's just how it goes some of them were interested um and it was actually it was a conversation with a work colleague i had when i was um i was working 
for Scottish Power. And it was a colleague at work who'd said, oh, have you heard about Virginia Tech? Um, we've heard good things about that. And not just from an engineering point of view. He, he'd known people that had gone over there on exchanges from Strathclyde. And I said, oh, no, I haven't, but I'll check it out. And I wasn't really expecting much because I assumed they wouldn't have much to the sport, to be honest. It would be a kind of technical school by the sounds of Virginia Tech. Um, and it would be very kind of academic focused. Of course, I looked into it and I looked at the times of their athletes coming into college and leaving college. I'm like, wow, this coach does a brilliant job of developing people. Um, I think I've come across them that not a lot of other people have. And so got in touch and uh, they were very quick back to me, very forthcoming in what, um, what they were all about. And I got on very well with the coach quite quickly who, who shared a lot of the same sort of belief with me as, as, uh, as how to get better, how to, uh, how to improve. And he was a, a very serious but um, a very knowledgeable guy. You could tell right away uh and yeah just the conversations we had really felt like i could see myself doing well there and just the record that their team had of producing you know great athletes by the time they left that you wouldn't really think so uh when they went into college so that was what really drove it um and ended up yeah virginia tech ended up winning out in my uh sort of success though they weren't on my radar before and so I'd certainly, as a point of advice, be absolutely open to to all avenues and, and pull out uh, if you're looking at college in the US. Moved to the US, there, it's quite a collegiate atmosphere as well, so there was still quite the college aspect, like the team aspect, and it's quite mm -hmm. defined goals around um, the sort of different seasons, isn't it, cross-country and track. Um, but now that you've left... Um, that collegiate as aspect, um, one of our questioners, Michael Cross, you'd like to know how do you set your goals for yourself and what happens if you don't achieve them? Generally, at the start of every year or season, I'll sit down with my coach and figure what figure out what we want to do with the, you know, the upcoming years. It's, it's never something that I would do to absolutely fixate on one particular time or particular um one particular growth point year on year more the case of we want to be here in five years certainly coming into Virginia I mean my my goal was yeah to be at the level where I could make a, a, a team um, be at the table where I could represent me um, by the time I, I left um, and to do that coach Thomas uh, that's still my coach to this day Ben um, he was very accommodating in the fact that he knew I had aspirations outside of just the, the team itself. And he was really supportive of went home um, and competed and he would prepare me. It's not as if these things can be uh, done without the other. The, obviously team success was just as important. So he was determined uh, that, you know, the goals would be we win a conference championship or, we, you know, individually we win a conference championship or we make it to the national final. Um, and just being at that level will, will mean that uh, things will take care of themselves when I go, you know, uh, sort of individual aspiration, uh, be it like an under 23 qualification uh, for, for Team GB, which um, I, I did a couple of times while at Virginia Tech, these sort of things. He was more than supportive of uh, me having these goals as well. So it, it's important to, to talk about that with a potential coach in, in the NC about how uh, supportive they would be about what you want to do outside of just competing for the team. What's Ben's um, sort of coaching philosophy deal in the way? What, sort of, what I mean, like, what would a typical week look like for you? And, and um, I think people would be interested in how you train. It's certainly, it's up over the years. I mean, he was quite patient with me where I think in terms of mileage, I would maybe run 30 miles a week or something like that uh, when I was was still, uh, you know, living in Glasgow before I came out to the US. And we've, in terms of that, we've slowly built it sort of year on year um, to the point where in terms of volume, maybe we do about 80 miles a week in, in the winter and, uh, you know, a, bit, a little bit less as we approach championships. But in terms of a typical week, um, he, he's quite big on quality. 
um, we 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 work quite hard, quite a few more often than most groups do per week. I mean, often we can have maybe um, three or four sessions in a in a typical sort of build up towards us in one week, whereby maybe a Monday um, we'll have a sort of light lighter session that's focused on threshold so we'll maybe do um 1k reps with a sort of 60 second jog and that's keeping you know keeping controlled um certainly on that monday session um all about keeping the heart rate within a certain zone but you, you get to know this um kind of by feel uh, after doing so many of these sessions but you know we might do maybe six by a k on monday something like that all quite controlled um tuesday we would run easy it would maybe be a long sort of 70 minute run something like that um wednesday is big on hills so our hardest day of the week is normally wednesday in a typical kind of build up towards the season this is what he'd call a base phase so we do sort of three 1200 meter hills three 800 meter hills and three 300 meter hills um, and that's some of the toughest sessions that we do is, is really mm-hmm. knocking our pan in um, up hills. And um, where I train just now, the guys I train with are a lot stronger than me, shall we say, going up the hills. So, get, uh, yeah, I, I guess I certainly see the back of people as they fly away from me up the hills. But that's, I find that a good environment to have. I like it. I like it when I'm not necessarily the best in my training group when people can really push me that hard um, and hells have never been my strong point so um, usually uh, those are the toughest for me and then we might come back in the afternoon on a Wednesday um, and do 300 meter reps um, between maybe 44 and 39 seconds with a couple of minutes between them maybe six reps something like that so it's, it's quite hard but not a full on track session um, but a lot of people are, are quite surprised to, to hear that two sessions in one day that that would happen maybe once a week um and it's certainly not something i advise younger people to do that's something that i've uh that we've been able to build in after years and years of um you know (laughs) looking like we're going to be able to handle that and a friday session could typically typically be a long sort of uh tempo effort uh we might likes to do usually um would be uh, a of tempo whereby pace wise I might start quite uh, every mile you pick it up to where you're running maybe five flat or four minute 450 uh, sort of pace per mile by the end of it um, it would have been easy running on Thursday tempo on the Friday and then Saturday a long run which uh, bucks the trend of, of a lot of people long running on sunday a lot offended by that and then <laughs> usually we have uh, we have an off day i know right um have an off day on sunday so, uh we, we structure it where the run usually is followed up by uh, a rest day on sunday sometimes oh. a little jog on sunday but often a rest day um so it's a little bit different than, than most groups he's he likes it differently does uh does my coach yeah there's some things there that are still like some of the basic things that some of the kids are doing and giving it like learning their tempo run. So, um, so we've got an old name. Croy's asked, "What's your favourite and um, your favourite session and your least favourite session?" Okay, um, least favourite is quite easy. It will be long tempos. It's just not. It's not really my forte. I'm not good at the patient state type running it's it 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 always uh is always a challenge for me but uh, basically the faster it gets the more fun i have when it comes to training so my favorite sort of sessions are when things get quite specific leading into uh championships um and uh, a favorite of mine is called 300 cutdowns or we might have six reps of 300 meters usually with about three minutes in between reps themselves are quite involved it's not just a case of trying to hit a time for the rep you're supposed to cut down during the rep so what he'll often have us do is run the first 14 seconds the next 100 at 13 seconds and then 12 seconds so sort of simulating what can often happen in a race it's just mm-hmm. just you know cutting down uh pretty aggressively at the end of a race so you end up maybe running you know 39 38 seconds for 300 
but in a much harder way than it would be if you were just to do it quite evenly. The whole yeah. point is to, you know, accelerate, accelerate through it and practice changing pace. And I think um, my coach's style of training that often lots of changes of pace within reps is probably a big reason why usually I'm quite comfortable with, uh, with, with uh, tactical races and they tend to be my strong suit is because we do work on it. Mm-hmm. And that 300 cut down workout is an example um, where, you know, uh, I feel like I get a lot better when it comes to race day and things are quite tactical and you know that there's going to be a big accelerator usually comfortable with it so there's a couple of people got the same sort of question here and it's about asking about the lockdown i don't know what it's been like in america neil but how have you managed callum and donald like to know about how you kept motivating yourself through the lockdown yeah um i was out in the u.s when you know, the world changed a little bit last March and everything became very different in, uh, in, in what we were allowed, to, what we were and weren't allowed to do. I was quite lucky in that I was in uh, Arizona at that point, was still able to just about get an access to track. Um, and, you know, it, for distance running, we're quite lucky in that we don't need incredible facilities or what have you to get good training in. We can do it wherever we want distance runners often um when there's a will there's a way with that kind of thing so doing a lot of work just on on trails and have you just had a good environment at that time um and in terms of staying motivated uh, that was still the case of well we hope the olympics is still happening in, in mm-hmm. 2020 that obviously wasn't the case um but in terms of staying motivated i was just eager to to train hard because of the fact that I've got, you know, another year I could make up ground on people that are better than me at the moment. There's no other way to put it. Um, you know, coming off the final in Doha 2019, it was clear that I needed to get a lot stronger if I was ever going to live with people the likes of Tim Chariot, um, who'd taken the race out so fast. And I just wasn't, I knew I wasn't at the level where I could live with that. Um, so it was a chance focus and look at it as a chance where I can get stronger I can work on the the stuff that I don't like so much in training I could put emphasis on uh, all the longer reps and the tempos and the hills um, all the really the tough parts that maybe aren't my strength but are the stuff they're going to need to get better if I'm ever going to um, be competitive uh, in terms of getting global medals so in terms of staying motivated it was just a case of a shift of football. like I have been given more time um, and I just had to look at it um, as a bit of a, a gift rather than uh, rather than a hint to, to what I wanted this year which of course it was but I had to you know frame it a bit differently if that makes sense. No that does. I've got quite a few questions about racing so if we could maybe move on to that. Um, I think people want to probably to draw on your experience of Racing, Neil. Um, so Jack's asked, what's your before race day and um, race day routine? Um, and Pauline's also interested about any pre- favourite pre-race food. So what, what's her kind of routine, I think? I'm not too superstitious, so not everything has to be perfect before a race. Uh, but generally, um, you know, you, you're wanting to get a good meal the night before. I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, like my quality. There's no perfect pre-race meal. If you haven't been eating right for the past three days, then it doesn't matter tonight. I wouldn't say that, but he would say there is no perfect pre-race meal. Just, you know, eat well as you normally would. There's, there's no way you're going to make up or lose ground uh, as long as you're eating a decent meal the night before. It would be something like, um, breast, uh, you know, vegetables, mashed potatoes, that kind of thing. Just a, a mix of things. Getting good protein, carbs, and fats, and um, is it, important every day. Um, so just as, as it is the day before race, um, the day of the race, typically I'll get up, eat some breakfast, which could be, you know, usually it will be porridge um, with some peanut butter, some nuts maybe some fruit just for some some good fats um and some nut butter 
and then maybe toast and eggs as well. Um, and after that, I like to go out for a sort of 15 minute jog um, and do four or five strides on the morning of the race. Some people like to do strides the day before. I completely understand my coach likes to do strides to sort of wake up the body on the day of the race. Okay. Metabolism really going. Um, so that would typically be sort of right after breakfast, which I don't mind doing on a sort of full stomach. I don't like that, but it, you just got to find out what works for you. Um, so typically that might be seven or eight hours before I race. And then I would have a decent lunch. It would just be something simple that doesn't need to be too complicated. And like, I don't know, turkey, avocado type sandwich, um, anything that, you know, agrees with you well. And you just kind of got to figure out by trial and error. There's no real way um, about how many hours you're sort of eating before you're racing. Yeah. Um, and that's something I got wrong so much kids uh, as a sort of youngster. And you just kind of figure it out as you go along and, eventually if you keep you know keep tinkering with it i'm sure you'll you tend to find something that works for you in terms of when you like to eat um how you like to feel in terms of your stomach before a race uh and maybe three hours before a race i'll have like a two or three hours before a race i'll have maybe like a protein bar um just to keep me going but it's still quite light um my lunch might be five hours before a race um and really uh, on race day it's the case of switching off what you're going to do tonight you don't need to be sitting there nervous um say it's an, an evening race you don't need to be sitting there nervous all day because it's just gonna it's gonna waste energy and you're gonna tense up and it's not um it's not useful at all so generally you want to switch off a little bit from what you're going to do tonight because there'll be plenty of time before you warm up to really lock in and focus yeah. um you want to stay off your feet as much as you can but not sit in one position the whole the whole day get up and walk around you know do really would don't change things wildly just because it's race day just, just be natural um on the day so that your your body's not all tense and locked up uh it generally gives the best for I'm too focused all day and hyper sort of aware of yeah. what i'm doing at all times then sometimes it's just, it's just not the way the way forward it's better to be more relaxed and um just take just take things a bit more naturally well, that, that was our, my next question was going to be, how do you handle your nerves on the day? Pauline uh, mentioned that, you know, do you get nervous and how do you deal with it? Um, I actually probably get less nervous now than I used to when I was competing when I was younger, when I was sort of under 13, under 15. I wouldn't be that good at controlling my nerves and every race seemed like the most important thing of all time. Um <laughs> And at the time, I mean, it was, it was, it was, yeah. it, was it was so important. Every race was and the last and it was, you know, uh, which was great, but it's not necessarily the best way to approach a race. You, you know, if your nerves are out of control, then maybe you're not going to get the most out of yourself. So these days, experience has helped a lot having raced a lot um that's obviously helped quell nerves but more than that you just got to look at your nerves as a tool rather than an actual um hindrance to you because they can allow you to do things that never be able to when you're training and you're not nervous that that's clear in so many uh, aspects of the sport there are things you can do when you're nervous that just allow you to have an extra gear you've got to look at it um you know, a lot of people would say it's privilege, which it absolutely is. If you really care that much and you're really, um, you're, you're, you're feeling a little nervous about a race that's coming up, that's good. Just use it. Yeah. It's, it's going to get a little more out of you if, if you're positive about it. If you, this is what really makes me feel alive is if I'm, uh, you know, feeling a bit nervous before a race, then great. That, that's how you have to look at it you just have to reframe it a little bit rather than oh i'm nervous i don't want to be here yeah it's, it's more like oh i'm nervous that means that i really care about this that means i really want to do well here uh, and that's how i would use okay. it basically it, it makes me feel quite alive when i've got the sort of butterflies in the stomach it makes me realize uh, that i'm doing the sport for the yeah. right reasons and all the pros get it you could see jacob and gabritson yawning on the line the other night and that's a sign of adrenaline so it's not like it's that you know that all all the seniors get nervous as well and they do like to mm -hmm. harness that as well um holly yes. holly's asked about what's your tactics for running 1500 meters 
it was quite certainly a broad all... question, but only <laughs> running for. <laughs> Yeah, how long have you got? Um, I'll, it'll, it'll, always, it'll always depend. Yeah, I need to write a book about that one day. Um, it'll always depend on what the field you're racing against is for me. Um, often, you know, if it's a kind of time trial race, maybe there's a pacemaker, then it becomes a bit more simple. Usually what I like to do is get on the rail, get on the inside of the lane and just try and relax as much as possible in a good position in the race, not to make too many moves. There are lots of people that spend a lot of energy trying to all be in the right place throughout a whole 15-minute race, whereas you only really need to be in the right place once, and it's you know, towards the end of the race. So if you can manage your energy um, throughout a 500 meter race, particularly... Um, particularly when it's a, a sort of time trial, you know, fast paced race and wait um, until you're really ready to, to kick hard and finish strongly. And um, that's how I tend to approach it. Mm -hmm. If it's likely for a championship sort of tactical style race, then it's going to be a case of um, positioning yourself at the right. Um, it's, it's all about timing at, at a high level 1500 meter race, whereby you know, you can be in the right chin, but it's maybe too early or you're, you know, you're running in lane two or three for quite a lot of the race. And uh, by the time you actually go to kick hard at the end, you've actually spent too much energy just by, by being on the outside, being on the fringes, mm -hmm. rather than someone who's maybe sat at the very front, very back, and has actually just conserved energy running lane one and not making too many hasty moves, not making too many rash decisions. Um, and you'll often find that these athletes that have conserved the most energy <laughs> ones that you know have have the kick at the end rather than just being the ones that are the kickers it's actually maybe they've actually managed their energy better than their competitors yeah so that was a real good question there holly and um, jacob's wondering how you keep motivated during a race <laughs> keep <laughs> during a race I mean, <laughs> it's no it's a, definitely a valid question it's harder. It's, there's on the line for me then never a problem being motivated during a race but um i, I know what you mean like certainly when i was younger you when it starts to think why am i doing I think, this hey, like, that's this probably what lot. he's meaning yeah I no I, it's it's no it's a great question like, this hurts a lot why am i doing this and what i usually do in those moments is think about um those that are wanting me to do well you can you know you can there are other things to focus on but this is what works for me is focus on the people that i know we at home be watching in the stands be um willing me to do well and when you think about that sort of thing saying well i don't want to let them down i don't want them to see me unhappy after this race i don't want any of that um they want to see me do well so why would i you know, why would I listen to this, to my, my brain saying, this is so, or stop this, um, if I know it's only going to last for so long and it's going to be worth it when, you know, I get to see those people after a race and uh, it's going to all be worth it because I, I fought hard when it got difficult in the race, which it always does. Well, Cameron's got a question about running in touring and how it was without the crowd. What was it like? something about what the experience has been like um the, the sort of no crowd thing wasn't as much as a factor as you might think everything becomes kind of a blur when you start uh racing particularly at this level when things are happening quite fast <laughs> everything becomes such a blur um found racing with no crowd to the point that uh, almost don't notice it mm -hmm. You notice it afterwards, you notice it sort of beforehand, but once you're in the heat of that moment, it's, it's no big deal, really. Um, obviously, I would prefer to have a crowd. I love that kind of atmosphere, the buzz you get before a race. But um, it doesn't make as much of a difference as perhaps you'd think. Yeah, maybe not as so much in running and some of the other sports. And um, we're, we're getting yeah. to, to the end, Neil, because... Um, you probably want to get your tea <laughs> and stuff. But um, last time we, we did um, the question and answer back in 2019, I remember a couple of things that you said um, that really struck me and kept with me that sleep's the best recovery agent that there is. 
Um, and that was really important, I think, for young athletes to hear. And was it you who also said, you allow yourself 24 hours to whinge and moan, and then you need to get back on again? On from because of advice as well. So, how are you feeling now? 24 hours, mm-hmm. I know it's a good, <laughs> that's, that, that's, the, that's the perfect question for this weekend. Yeah, I absolutely took 24 hour rule pretty seriously. I was fuming at the result um, on Friday night. I really thought I came into this championship in the, the sort of best condition I ever have. I mean, I in Doha 2019, I was in great shape and things went well, but I'm better now than I was then and was was looking to win a medal at these championships. It's, it's plain and simple and, and not just a medal. I, I thought I was the level of the likes of Jakob Brixton. I thought if things went my well, I went well, I could challenge him and Lewandowski. I didn't. Um, I made a mistake that cost me uh, I made a move to the field um, where I was running a lot of distance, but there wasn't a whole lot I could do at that point. But overall, just, you know, didn't... I've watched it back a little bit. I was kind of sandwiched between two people at the start line. It, it happens in 15 to racing. But I, you can always, to an extent, control these things. And I should have... You know, got the elbows out more at the start. I should have been sharper at the line. I should have been, you know, this is part of 1500 meter racing. It's just the reality of it. I should have given as good as good as I got, and I really didn't. I was quite passive, and I got bullied a little bit. Um, but that's part of it. I mean, I, I, I I've done the same to other people before. Just you know, take take the authoritative position in races. And you know, I, I could feel hard done by or whatever. But really, it was just mistakes that, you know, that led to bad performance um and, you know I, I did win a little bit for 24 hours because i'm thinking you know really again another sort of european championship i've just come in here with such high hopes and, and and left so disappointed but there are thankfully much bigger things coming this summer and uh, well, well on it for the next week or so i don't have time for that um, I have to prepare what's going to be a tough Olympic team to make in 1500 meters this year. And if I'm too long thinking about the mistakes I made this weekend, then um, I <laughs> just setting myself on the back foot work for what's going to be really important preparation for the summer. Um, hopefully, I, I can forget about one this weekend if, if, if things go, go to plan. Um, and I can take confidence in the fact that. I felt probably better than I've ever felt anywhere ever in that heat. Um, and the final didn't reflect uh, how I felt. And I'm still in that physical condition. Um, just a case of, of getting it right um, going forward. I don't think I've ever gotten it, you know, 26 years of age. I don't think I've ever got it so wrong uh, in a one particular race as I did on Friday night, but that's just the harsh reality of indoor 1500 meter racing, particularly when there's as many as uh, on a tight track. It, it, it was big fields, wasn't it, as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah typically it's only 10 in an yeah. indoor final, so I don't know why they were letting in so many people. I'm not and, uh, understood that, but it, it is what it is. I mean, I, I was signed up for that. That was what it was, and everybody had the same uh, playing field. I just came out worse off. I mean, I'm sure you're in that shape. It's it was it was a mistake, and you've just got to move on from mistakes, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. No choice so, but fun and refocus. To maybe sort of finish off in a more positive view, there was quite a few questions in from Carolyn, Alex, Rob, and Patricia around. Really, there were themes where what would what would be the advice you would give to young athletes? What would you pass on to them? Um, be the best piece of advice you've been given as well in your own career and also what advice you would pass on to young folk yeah i mean in terms of better at the sport it's, it's often that actually the hours around training that make the most difference um to success 
what what happens in training is important in the sessions themselves you've got to apply yourself there and come with a good attitude and you know be ready to, to work hard in training but the hours around it when you're not at the track are actually when you improve you don't improve during a training session you actually make yourself worse and then your body adapts to what you've just done to it your body says oh i didn't like that maybe i'm gonna need to be ready for um i'm gonna be need to be ready to do that again and your body adapts the stimulus that you provide it so the number one thing as you brought up earlier is sleep um this is the number one thing that can increase your performance without uh you know crossing uh crossing illegal lines it's the number one performance answer as i always say so basically you want to be getting eight and 10 hours of sleep a night that's a great start um in terms of recovery you want to be eating well you want to be getting in good vegetables um and in terms of macronutrients protein carbohydrates and good fats um have got to be in your diet that'll allow your body to process training better um you know having a recovery drink ready after our recovery bar whatever after training is important the fuel your body our process the training you've just done um i'm a big believer in the hours outside of training um making good decisions are really what set apart the better from uh, the athletes that the, the, the athletes that don't seem to see an improvement. Um, so uh, the biggest is, is um, the hours outside your train just as um, just as um, uh, just as a high level of priority as the hours you're actually showing um, to your training sessions. Yeah, I think we as coaches do try to emphasize that quite a lot and it, it's important to get it's yourself good. kind of organized and make sure you're getting enough to eat and enough to eat yep. enough sleeping do you eat quite a lot then you uh, come back <laughs> home food bill skyrocket <laughs> as they always like to remind me so yeah I, I eat i eat plenty that's for sure um it just you need to yeah. when you're when you're asking so much of your body basically um so uh, you, you often, you know, when I was younger, you just can't eat enough, to be honest. I was, I was filling an empty, uh, filling a sort of bucket with it. Um, but the energy demands of this sport are so high that, uh, yeah, it's crucial that you eat enough. Ronnie's interested in knowing, this is a, my last question. <laughs> we've, hopefully we've covered everybody's question. What's next, Neil? What's your next target? What are you doing now? Um, it's of training i'm gonna go back to uh, my, my training set up in eugene oregon with my coach um i haven't seen him since the beginning of january so it'd be good to get back in the training group that's that's running really well right now it'd be good to get in with with my usual crew um but it's it's all going to be in preparation for uh was you know a huge year a huge olympic year so my goal um is to perform as as well in the olympics um that obviously but but my goal isn't just to you know be on that that to tokyo um i want to be competitive in the the olympic final uh place as high as i can in, in that olympic final there are obviously a huge amount of intermediate steps to doing that but um i'll need to take boxes along the way the best I guess making that Olympic team that is the farthest thing from a foregone conclusion with how strong the 1500 meter running is in the UK. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's the goal this year and everything else is, is pretty peripheral. Yeah. So you're going back to America quite soon. Yeah. Yeah. In the next couple of weeks um, to get back to training set up. So that'll be, that'll be good. Because as much as, uh, I do find training in, in Glasgow. It'll be nice to have sort of some company um, and yeah. maybe some better weather. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Eugene, and it's 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 a it's a, it's a nice place to train. A lot warmer, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Certainly in the summer, a whole lot warmer. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. Well, it, well, Neil, I think you've given everybody a lot of excitement this weekend. We were all excited beforehand and also watching it and. You might feel like you didn't perform the way that you should, but we're all still really proud um, that you've been a member of the club and done so well 
uh, to get to the European Championships. Kate didn't go the way in one race. It's one race you can put it behind you and move on. But I think you're inspiring a lot of the young kids all the time with just the way that you conduct yourself. And <laughs> <laughs> well, first, uh, thank you, Len, because I get so much support from from everyone at Gifnook. So thanks for um, thanks for all the messages and support this weekend. It, I really do. And it means a lot. So thank you very much. And, and all the best for your return journey, etc. And day uh, back in America, and we'll hear from you soon, no doubt. Thanks very much, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you.